second webinar. We're so glad that you joined us today. I'm Ingrid Nielsen, Chair of the WASHA Education Committee. Uh, you see here at WASHA, our vision is to revolutionize how people view their health by transforming patients into empowered and active partners in their health care. To that end, we're really delighted to have Io Dolka present today. Uh, she's the founding board member and immediate past executive director of WASHA, and she's made great contributions to the evolving field of health advocacy. Um, today, Io will be speaking on misdiagnosis and patient advocacy. And uh, most of us have heard uh, of medical errors where patients get the wrong drug or surgery on the wrong body part, but recent studies have shown that misdiagnosis, uh, that is diagnoses that are missed, incorrect, or delayed are far more common, and they are believed to affect 15 to 20 percent of cases. And EO is going to help us sort that out and give us perspective on that today. Uh, she, EO experienced a decade-long journey from health to bedridden sickness and back, which has inspired her commitment to patient advocacy and her passion for misdiagnosis in particular. She holds a Master's of Science degree in biotech studies and has worked in a variety of scientific and business environments, including the National Institutes of Health. She holds a certificate in patient advocacy from UCLA and served as an elected member of the National Patient Advocate Certification Steering Committee, which was tasked with creating a national credential for patient advocates. So before we get started, I wanted to make one logistics comment. We're recording this talk so that it will be um, posted on our website uh, at a later date. And for that reason, there is a slight delay depending on your computer system. So all participants are muted, but on the side of your screen, you should see a chat box for questions. And you can type in your questions at any time during the speaker's presentation. And at the end of the presentation, I'll select several questions to discuss. And any questions that remain unanswered will uh, follow up with an email. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to EO. Welcome, EO. Thank you, Ingrid, very much. Hello, everybody. I am really glad to be here and talk to you about misdiagnosis and patient advocacy. It's a subject that's very dear to my heart, as um, Ingrid briefly mentioned. We have a lot to talk about, so I am not going to um, waste much time, and I'm just going to get right through it. Just to walk you through the presentation outline, we're going to cover four areas today. Um, we will start with the definitions and data around diagnostic error, and then um, go into the roots of misdiagnosis, talk about what is being done, and also uh, we will finish with actionable steps that you can take uh, if you are a patient advocate or if you're a patient yourself to help um, with what's going on. I hear a noise inside and I don't know what it is, but I hope that you can hear me just fine. All right, so what is a misdiagnosis? Misdiagnosis is really an error. It's an error in assessment um, or a diagnosis of a medical condition. And we have three types of misdiagnosis that are currently more or less agreed upon by everybody. It's the delayed, the missed, and the wrong diagnosis. The delayed diagnosis is when there is sufficient information to make a determination as to what's cause, causing the symptoms, but it's not done on time. Uh, a missed diagnosis is when no diagnosis is ever made, even though sufficient information is available usually. And the wrong diagnosis is when another diagnosis is made before the correct one. So, you know, you go to your doctor, for uh, with X problems and they think that you have X disease when you actually have disease Y. How widespread is this problem? Actually this is a pretty widespread problem and most people don't even know about it. One in 20 people um, are misdiagnosed each year around the world actually but in the United States if you extrapolate these numbers that means 12, 12 million people 
in the US yearly are misdiagnosed. This is a staggering number. If you kind of calculate forward, you'll see that in all of our lifetimes, each of us, chances are, uh, chances are that we will be the victim of, it, of misdiagnosis a couple of times. 50% of those diagnostic errors have the potential to be really harmful. And what we, we're talking about when we're talking about harm is delayed treatment for a serious disease or a necessary treatment of a non-existing disease. And unfortunately, 40,000 to 80,000 people with misdiagnosis die every year from the result of that wrong, delayed, or misdiagnosis. Just to give you a perspective, about 40,000 pe 40, people every year die from breast cancer, and we know much more about breast cancer than we know about misdiagnosis. So it's, it's kind of important to understand how, we, how widespread the problem is, even though we really don't hear much about it, but hopefully this will change in the next few years. Now, historically, the majority of the information regarding diagnostic error came from autopsy reports and malpractice lawsuits. And from those malpractice lawsuits, we have uh, data that say that um, 25 to 59 percent of malpractice claims are due to misdiagnosis. It depends on what research you're looking at, but basically that's the range. That's a staggering number. About a uh, billion dollars a year are awarded in the U.S. due to these reasons. If we look at settings where these claims are um, coming from, I'm sorry, uh, here you go. Um, outpatient settings have number one reason, uh, have the diagnostic error as their number one reason, and inpatient settings have the diagnostic error as their number two reason. Overall, the top, the top claims related to diagnostic error come from breast cancer cases. Again, uh, we know a lot of breast cancer. We know a lot about breast cancer, so it's not a surprise that this comes here. That's number one. And for claims in primary care, emergency medicine, and cardiology, acute myocardial infarction is actually the top subject of diagnostic error. So it's pretty common conditions, not, not necessarily something very rare. The top three, no matter which setting you're looking at, conditions um, that are most commonly misdiagnosed is cancer, stroke, and heart disease, especially heart disease in women and the elderly. And um, in this list, we add pneumonia, heart failure, kidney failure, irritable bowel syndrome, and urinary tract infection. So it's actually, as I said before, it's very interesting to look at that list and realize that it's the common conditions, not necessarily the very rare, that are um, topping these lists. However, autoimmune diseases um, like lupus, celiac disease, fibromyalgia, IRA, and MS also are usually very delayed in getting a, a diagnosis. And some gynecolo gynecological conditions like polycystic ovary syndrome and endometriosis um, also are the subject of diagnostic error. Talking about endometriosis, um, award-winning British author Hilary Mantel, you may know her, is one of the faces of diagnostic error that resulted in serious harm. Some of you may know her from the PBS series Wolf Hall, which was based on her similarly titled book. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, what happened to her, and then the next slide we're going to listen her talking about her experience. So her problems started when she was about 11 years old, and by the time she turned 18, uh, she started having a lot of different symptoms like nausea, vomiting, fatigue, and aching legs, and so on. Um, and she started going to doctors who were not able to figure out what was wrong with her. After she went um, to several physicians, uh, they basically couldn't figure out what was happening, so they decided everything must be in her head, which I'm pretty sure you all have heard before. This is not the first time you hear such a case. And uh, they offered her tranquilizers and antidepressants, and uh, as, as Hilary Mantel put it in an interview to The Guardian, they offered her the opportunity of a career as a psychiatric patient, which in the end she found the strength to decline. Uh, throughout her 20s, this happened. Um, she sought diagnosis, but, but she faced dismissal of her symptoms. And diagnosis came many years later um, on the operating table. 
when finally, uh, through years of pain and agony, continuous bleeding and inability to stand upright, she was uh, put for an exploratory surgery. And that's when they um, finally diagnosed her with a severe case of endometriosis. And to um, help her at the time, uh, they had to remove part of her bowel, part of her bladder, her entire uterus and ovaries, in essence, actually um, making her go into menopause in, the late, in her late 20s. So you can understand the harm that was actually caused by, by that delayed diagnosis um, and that was actually the wrong diagnosis was really extreme. But I will let her talk about how she felt about that. Um, in her interview she gave uh, very recently actually to Frederick Scav Scavlin who is um, having one of the most um, uh, popular shows in Scandinavia. You, 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 you write also uh, about your illness. Uh, yes. You, you've, been, you've been ill a lot. Uh, yes. in your life, from, from yes. quite an early beginning. Yeah, so by the time I was uh, 19 or so, I, I realized there was something physically wrong and the doctors were very unhelpful. And basically they told me, it's all in your mind, you're just imagining it. There are, is no disease that accounts for these symptoms. But there was, and you were you when, were diagnosed in the end. When, when I was twenty-seven, uh, yes, I was discovered to have a condition called endometriosis, which is a gynecological disease affecting young women, um, which is it, it's quite common. It's not usual for it to be as severe as it was in my case, but by the time the disease was given a name a great deal of damage had been done to my body and it, it, it's something that um, I had to really live with lifelong and it's only in the last couple of years that I've really recovered my health. So life has been unnecessarily hard. But how, how do you think being ill so much of your time has influenced your personality? I think it influenced the course of my life because I probably wouldn't have become a writer if it hadn't been for this. When I was 22 or so, I began to think, if I am going to make an impact on the world, I must have a career that, well, and it was at that stage that I started writing seriously. Um, but I think, as for one's personality, it's for other people to say, but being in chronic pain, it doesn't make you a nicer person, it doesn't make you saintly. Uh, I think it makes you shut down. And you only have a very little bit of energy so you have to ration it. It also means, in a sense, that you work twice as hard as other people because you have something to prove. Uh, you know, you, you have to prove that you are as good as other people despite this. Um, so what, what happens is your life um, becomes work, you won't fulfill your ambitions, but you don't have any fun. You have. Um, <laughs> but now I do. I hope, I hope you do now. I've had more fun in the last year than in all my life. <laughs> well, <I'm laughs> That's wonderful. So um, it becomes real when you hear it from the person who suffered through it, I think. And um, unfortunately, as you know, Mantel's story is not an exception. As we mentioned earlier, studies show that harm is caused in half of all diagnostic error cases. So let's look uh, into harm a little bit more closely. There was a study recently that was done um, in, in, in a large VA hospital and, and primary healthcare system. And they looked at records 
um, of their patients and kind of retroactively went back in uh, to see who was misdiagnosed and what happened to them. So what they found was that most errors had the potential for moderate to severe harm in that study. And if you look at that pie chart, you will probably be able to place Mantel on the 19% of series of permanent damage. If you do the math, you'll see that about 90% of these um, people had uh, considerable to a considerable harm to immediate or inevitable death. So it's pretty pretty staggering if you look at those numbers. Now, when we look at the um, the severity of error and the setting. I'm going to walk you through this slide because it's a little bit complicated. We have three columns on the left. The blue column talks about the inpatient cases of misdiagnosis. The orange column on the right talks about the outpatient cases of misdiagnosis and the pie chart in the middle basically summarizes the percentage of where things happened. So you will see that even though the majority of diagnostic error took place outside the hospital, 56% in that study, the uh, the harm that was caused within the hospital walls was significantly bigger, significantly more um, harmful than what could happen outside the hospital walls, with about half of those cases resulting in deaths. So that's um, another thing to think about how actually um, harmful um, the diagnostic error becomes within the hospital walls. So. Let's look now at the reason uh, the researchers identified these errors took place. They um, summarized five top categories of contributing factors to diagnostic error in, the, in this study. I'm just going to start backwards just to keep things interesting for you. Um, and we're going to start from number five all the way to number one. Uh, the, uh, the, the number five reason that this happened was performance and interpretation of diagnostic tests. So that means misinterpreting diagnostic results, not considering results important, or just having wrong interpretation of need for follow-up. You know, is this important enough to follow up somebody? Number four reason was follow-up and tracking of diagnostic information. And what we include in that is having an adequate tracking or follow-up system. Um, physicians suggesting uh, too long of a period for a follow-up, so you kind of miss things in between, and um, considering condition not serious enough. In number three, we have patient-related factors, and that means actions or inactions by the patient that contributed to this problem, like failure to provide adequate medical history, and we will talk about medical history in the actionable steps. It's one of the things that um, people can really do to decrease the chances of getting diagnostic error. Um, also, uh, what we include in this category is failure to seek care or to understand ur urgency of what's going on and, of course, the failure between the patient and the provider re relationship, which is so crucial um, for healthcare. In number two, we have referrals. And that means problems initiating a needed referral, either because the physician didn't feel that the problem was serious enough to refer to a specialist, or they did feel that it was serious enough, but they didn't understand or know who to refer to. And the number one reason, with almost 80% of the cases being due to this, problem is the breakdown in the patient practitioner clinical encounter. And what we mean by that is uh, process breakdowns in the patient uh, practitioner clinical encounter that involve problems with history taking, history taking again, uh, physical examination, ordering of diagnostic tests for further workup and failure to review previous documentation. You will see that all these numbers don't add up and to a hundred and the reason is that um, a lot of these causes actually took place uh, simultaneous, simultaneously for uh, the same person. But it's staggering to see that the breakdown in the clinical encounter is by far uh, one of the most important reasons why misdiagnosis took place. Let's look now more generally into the roots of misdiagnosis. This is what happened in that study, but if one was to look at various published research and physician commentaries today from um, you know uh, various different areas, you could see that it's uh, human reasoning and systemic problems and the combination between the two that is really behind diagnostic error. 
and there are a few contributing factors here and I'm just going to walk you through each one. Relentless time pressure on practitioners is a fact. Um, patients don't like it, physicians themselves don't like it, but to increase reimbursement rates and uh, to also increase meaningful use requirements, the time is shrinking and the available time the physician actually has to um, talk with the patient is also, uh, while they're in it, uh, is also shrinking. And that contributes to diagnostic error. I think it's very easy to understand why. Cognitive biases and overconfidence on physicians is another issue and physicians and physician researchers themselves have talked extensively about this um, and this is not necessarily known um, wide, widely outside the medical field. As humans, no matter our profession, we all fall victim to our biases, whether we are cognizant of the fact or not. And doctors do too. Uh, that, that has been recognized as a significant part of the problem. There are more than a hundred biases affecting clinical decisions and I will talk more about the top three in the next uh, few slides. Now overconfidence is having too much confidence in one's diagnosis and physicians tend to believe strongly in their own diagnosis and that of course also contributes to what's called premature closure where a diagnosis is derived without further consideration of additional possible diagnosis. Interestingly, research has shown that academic affiliated physicians are less overconfident uh, than their non-academic colleagues. So that's something interesting to keep in mind. Another reason why we are seeing diagnostic errors is the growing complexity of medicine. I mean, just think about if your grandmother went to the doctor, I don't know, 60, 70 years ago when she was young, the doctor will probably have just a few different diagnoses in the back of their minds that could be um, applied in the case of your grandmother. But today, medicine is so complex, we know so much about um, about what could be going wrong with the body and there are so many op options of what to do to try to fix it that um, this is actually now contributing to this problem. According to the Society to Improve Diagnostic Error in Medicine, there are 13,000 known diseases, 13,000 uh, diseases, syndromes and types of injuries, about 4,000 different possible tests used to detect them and about 6,000 different medication treatments and types of surgery. Talking about complex. Um, let's move into the patient-provider communication breakdown. You saw in the previous slides where this comes into play. Um, Again, I think this is self-explanatory, but when the, when the sacred place where we sit to talk to our doctor um, is kind of violated by all of these requirements and when the communication starts to break down, it's very easy to see why this can contribute to diagnostic error. And last but not least, the increasing fragmentation of the healthcare system is really adding a lot to this problem. Uh, we, we all know what happens, you know, you go to your primary care physician, they want to, they want you to see a specialist, you go to another healthcare system to see the specialist, then you go somewhere else for your lab tests or your imaging studies and all of that information needs to come back into your medical record, into your PCP. The more steps you add to this um, and the more fragmentation, the more the chances that something will fall through the, the cracks and it does every day. Um, and of course all of that adds into the um, diagnostic care. So let's look briefly into um, human reasoning. Dr. Groupman, who is a Harvard physician and has um, written a couple of books, one of them I believe is called How Physicians Think, um, has taught about uh, cognitive errors and how they play a part in the diagnostic process and there are, as I said before, there are, there are about a hundred different um, biases that have been recognized to affect clinical decision making. But he focuses on three and I'm just going to talk briefly about them today because it's good to know that those can play a part when you are helping a patient or where you are the patient yourself. So those three are anchoring availability and attribution. Anchoring is basically when we throw an anchor and we launch on the first impression. Um, you can see something in the patient history or you can see something in the labs and you just throw your anchor right there and you say, okay, this is what's going on when, when it's not necessarily the, true, the truth. 
In availability, what happens is the most recent memory is applied to what's happening right now in front of you with this patient. So if you're a physician and you've seen, you know, 10 patients one after the other and they all have the flu, the 11th patient that comes in the hospital and looks like they have the flu, you're kind of quick to um, say this, oh, they must be having the flu. Well, they probably are having something else. That's when you're dealing with the availability bias. And finally, attribution, which is something that I think we're all familiar with. We all are um, doing it in our everyday lives, no matter if we like it or not, uh, which has to do with our stereotypes. And uh, it has to do with findings being skewed towards one stereotypes. There are numerous cases like that in the literature. And uh, an, an easy, an easy kind of example is to think about a man who comes in the hospital, um, he seems drunk, he seems like he's homeless, he has several issues, uh, he tells you that he doesn't drink that much but you think you know he's homeless, he looks like he's drinking, he probably uh, you know has alcoholic uh, related problems and then you dismiss that case uh, when in reality he's having uh, non-alcoholic related problems and you never treat him. So what is being done about all of these things? Uh, we learned about what misdiagnosis is and how we get there. Let's now see what is being done and also how patients are dealing with this. I try to put together a timeline for you uh, with the initiatives that have taken place so far um, and trying to, to show you what has been done. I think it's fair to say that um, more of an organized effort to understand diagnostic error and try to um, do research around it started after the IOM uh, published the report to Aries Human back in 1999. Even though re the report didn't necessarily talk about diagnostic error, it talked about procedural errors and um, medical errors in general, in general, it really did start um, the interest in this field. The National Patient Safety Foundation launched its annual Patient Safety Awareness Week in 2002 and two consecutive meetings in 2005 and 2006 uh, kind of set the stage for the creation of the Society to Improve Error in Medicine, which I think is safe to say it's probably the single um, most important organization in this field solely focusing on diagnostic error. The Society had its first uh, conference back in 2008 and it has it has have it is having one ever since every year and it's a um, opportunity for researchers and policy makers and patients to gather together and talk about diagnostic error and in the last year uh, in 2014 the patient safety awareness week for the first time had three webinars um, on diagnostic error that were offered and the IOM um, group that is responsible to generate a report that is hopefully coming out in the fall of 2015 uh, gathered for three meetings in, in 2014. So there's a lot happening lately and um, hopefully more will come through after this report is published um, in 2015. Now organizations that are, avail are active in this field, as I said, is the Society to Improve Diagnosis in Medicine, the National Patient Safety Foundation, AHRQ and IOM are probably the most prominent organizations that are focusing on this issue. On the side of the physicians, um, there are diagnostic tools available to help them with the diagnostic process. Isabel Visual DX and DX Plane are all software solutions that are used uh, by people in private practice and by physicians across clinical settings um, that, that help with this process. IBM Watson is a newer, the new kind of kid on the block and I'm excited about it because IBM Watson, um, as many of you might know, is a very capable um, uh, machine, let's say, for lack of a better word, uh, from IBM that has the potential to process input, input from a large amount of data. So IBM has focused on healthcare lately, um, trying to include a lot of the published research, a lot of uh, depersonalized medical records, and try to identify in patterns so that they can put all of that in use into healthcare treatments and hopefully healthcare um, uh, 
uh, healthcare uh, information regarding diagnosis. Now, on the side of the patients, what's happening is that because a lot of these people get frustrated that they cannot find what's wrong with them, they turn into their peers. So they turn into social media, they, they go to Facebook groups, they go to Twitter, they go to organized uh, patient societies like ACOR for cancer and patients like me and other societies out there. Um, and they start talking to their peers and they start f trying to figure out what's wrong with them. A company that tried to do this in a little bit more of a professional way is CrowdMed, which was started back in 2012. And CrowdMed um, provides a way for, for uh, patients to come in, submit information about their disease, and then on the other side of the screen have what they call medical detectives who are physicians, clinical people, but also patients themselves try to uh, offer differential diagnosis about what's going on and the patient can actually take those suggestions to their doctor and try to pursue them in, in the diagnostic process. CrowdMed supports that, uh, states that they have solved about a few hundred cases. I, I have been um, following them since they're beta, so it's, it's a very interesting experiment and it's, uh, it's interesting to see what's happening. But those are the tools that um, patients are using today trying to deal with what's going on. Now what can you do in this case? We talked a little bit about what's happening and the tools that are available but the most important thing is what can we do as patient advocates or as patients ourselves to um, help in this situation. I think advocates, care managers and patients can all play a crucial role and um, from what I have seen and from all the studies out there, there are three elements in misdiagnosis prevention. I would say patient engagement, care transitions, and then attention to a couple of different um, items that um, you know have come through. Patient engagement, um, as you know, patients are the most important care managers. As all of us, we are patients. We are with ourselves 24-7. And there are a lot of things to do um, before, during, and after um, the clinical encounter that is so important. Before the appointment, you remember we we talked about how important history is. So before the appointment, it's very, very important to sit down and prepare for that encounter. And if you're a patient advocate, to help that, that patient provide a complete history. And a complete history is something that's usually not done very well. So the, it's very important to do that ahead of time and to include all the conditions all the medications, especially if there are new medications. Sometimes, you know, symptoms arise after a patient has uh, started a new medication and they don't put two and two together. So it's very important to do that. At least all the surgeries, uh, lifestyle habits. You know, I like to dance and I cannot do that anymore. Or I'd like, I, I actually smoke every day. Uh, people, uh, physicians need to know these things and people many times uh, don't list them. And also activity levels and if those have changed. Presenting the chief complaint effectively is also very important um, in telling the story right. Um, it's, it's, it's often the case where patients are not able to do that. You know, when do, did things start? What exactly is the, the chief complaint? In general, try to provide the right narrative, the chronology and the context for the story. It's extremely important. And also to share impressions and express concerns. Um, in that story. Uh, as I said before, patients are with themselves 24-7. They see things many times, they see patterns, they have impressions about what's going on and how do things connect and what they think is happening. It's important to put those things in the, in the story and, and uh, relate that story to the physician. And also it's important for them to express the concerns. You know, what do they think might happen, what are they afraid of, um, and so on and so forth. And finally, of course, they need to gather their questions. And um, I'm sure as patient advocates, you know all these things, but it's very important to, um, to mention them. The Society to Improve Diagnosis in Medicine has a patient toolkit that can get you started if you're a patient or if you're a patient advocate um, in gathering all that information. And we will provide a link to that 
um, at the end of the talk with the emails that will be coming forward. But it's a it's a good place to start. Now, during the actual uh, appointment, one of the things that people don't mention very often is that it's very important for the patient to understand the diagnosis, the diagnostic process, and to understand whether the physician is is um, using kind of a working diagnosis. So um, that really helps with with the expectations that the patient has, and it also helps a lot with the entire. Uh, process and with a version of diagnostic error. So sometimes um, we don't, you know, you you, you are facing a, a situation where you have to go through various different steps to exclude many other conditions until you finally reach your um, the condition that is diagnosed for you. Other times, you know, a physician is kind of working with a not very well defined diagnosis so as, as he moves along you know he's able to offer more testing it's important for the patient to know this is happening and what they can expect um, it's also important for them to know uh, and understand what tests are for that's another um, area where diagnostic error can be caught early and understand the diagnosis if there is a diagnosis also to know what to expect and what are the red flags um, and to know what they can do to get better. You know, if your patient, if your physician tells you these are the things you can do to get better and you're doing them and you're not getting better, maybe you're not having the right diagnosis. Same thing goes for medications. It's not necessarily the only case, but it could be the case. And also at the end of the meeting, it's important to summarize the action items and, of course, have a follow-up plan. Uh, some physicians uh, now do this as part of the uh, final moments of the uh, encounter. They actually go into the medical record and they write what are the next steps, but it's important for the patient or the patient advocates to make sure that they summarize at the end of the meeting, okay, what are the next steps? What are we supposed to do? And when are we going to come back for a follow-up? So have that thing set up so that you can make sure you catch things as they happen. Now, after the meeting, there are two other things that I, I think are very important. Um, and the first one is to follow up with the doctor when things go wrong. Um, uh, patient advocates will probably have come across this. Many times patients have symptoms, new symptoms that have developed or um, some uh, side effects from the drugs. They fail to call the doctor, they fail to give that feedback and they kind of go on, on go off on their own um, basically abandoning this relationship. The physician doesn't have a chance to figure out that something is wrong. The patient is starting to get very frustrated with what's going on, but there is no communication between the two. And again, it's it's part of the breakdown of this of the relationship. So following up with the doctor afterwards is very important in making sure diagnostic error gets caught or um, is averted. And another thing that I learned from the um, uh, the Institute for Narrative Medicine at Columbia University in one of the talks that they gave, which I really thought was important, was to ask the patient what else is important for the physician to know. Um, sometimes we as patients all forget to put things into context and uh, maybe there's something else that's going on in your life that is very important that is part of the diagnostic information. Um, so sometimes we may think about this when we go back home, uh, but it's important to follow up with that patient and ask them so that the next time they go to the doctor, uh, they can offer that information. Moving now into care transitions, we saw from the studies um, and the data that were collected how important care transitions are and referrals and lab tests and all of those things. So. Appropriate documentation is key. Um, I would say that all uh, patients need to have a copy of every new medical record and of course of the old ones. When every new medical record re that is created is important for patients to have a copy of that and uh, make sure that they bring it with them every time they go to a new physician. And to review records and correct mistakes, um, especially if you get a copy of your old records where you can see narratives from physicians, um, you may spot mistakes. Um, I spotted one actually last week 
uh, in, in my own medical records when they wanted to write hypotension and they wrote hypertension. They're completely opposite conditions. So being treated for one um, is completely the opposite of being treated for the other. So it's important to review those records and correct mistakes and you can help avoid diagnostic error doing that. When you're dealing with referrals and second opinions, as patient advocates, um, we need to ensure that there is access to second opinions, especially if we're dealing with a diagnosis that is going to then entail a very um, difficult course of treatment or a potentially harmful course of treatment like radiation or chemotherapy. Uh, second opinions are very important. We need to ensure that these actually take place and help the patient get access to those. Confirm the referrals to specialists the, and, and when they have actually been placed. Many times the physician calls the referral, uh, the referring, um, I'm sorry, the physician calls the, the uh, specialist to be referred to, but this kind of falls through the cracks and you as a patient never get a call back. Uh, it's important to confirm all of these steps and then to verify that the medical records have, have actually been transferred before the patient goes in to see the specialist. Um, I'm sure you all know this happens many, many times every week when patients sit in front of physicians and unfortunately th those physicians don't know who they're seeing because they don't have the medical records in front of them. That's another area where uh, diagnostic error kind of creeps in. And when we have to deal with further testing like labs or imaging, and again, ensure that the, or the testing has been ordered and that the patient actually has gone to complete the testing. Uh, many times they forget or something happens and they don't go, uh, or the physician, uh, something happens with the, with the system when the physician is trying to put this into the system as an order. So make sure that these things are happening. And in general, make sure that there's adequate and timely follow-up for abnormal lab and imaging results. As we saw in the studies earlier, these things are another, another uh, area where people fall through the cracks and they add to the diagnostic error. And finally, talking about attention, what I, mean, what I mean by that is be mindful of the biases and pay attention to the symptoms and ensure the follow-up. So Dr. Groupman um, has been talking about these uh, three questions to ask that I really find very, very useful in an effort to counterbalance the, the um, existence of cognitive slips um, and overconfidence. Now, number one thing that he's saying to pay attention to and ask the question is, ask the question of what else could it be? So in, a, in, a, in essence, uh, kind of uh, probe your doctor to think for the differential diagnosis and um, get off the anchor or get off the, um, the availability kind of bias that he may be dealing with. Um, the second thing to ask is could two things be going on at once? I see this very, very often with uh, gray zone patients, which are the type of patients that I help, patients uh, who are um, you know, dealing with chronic diseases and, the, and they are undiagnosed. You're dealing a lot with uh, complicated medical histories. So two or th three things could be going on at once. And if you're trying as a physician to find the unifying diagnosis, you may be missing things. So again, you ask the, the physician in an effort to make them think a little bit outside of their biases and outside of the regular uh, shortcuts that we all, we all make. And the third question is, to ask if there's anything not in sync with the diagnosis in terms of results from labs or from diagnostic studies, imaging studies, because um, it's known that, and, and I think we all do that, but physicians also do it themselves, uh, physicians kind of tend to um, many times disregard what doesn't fit already in their diagnostic scenario, and that thing that doesn't fit sometimes actually has the uh, information that will guide you to the right diagnosis and if you disregard it you might get to the wrong diagnosis. So these are the three questions to, ha to, uh, to bring to the table when you're seeing a doctor and trying to find what's ailing you. And now in the symptom checklist, it's very important to keep, uh, to, to keep your attention to the symptoms and what's going on. Um, in, in various different studies, uh, 
it was shown that more than 50% of the cases, the main symptoms is actually not documented. So if you're a care manager, ensure that it's actually in the document. Um, if, if you're not, if you can't do that, just make sure that you, um, you talk about the main symptom. And if you're a patient advocate, that at least you can be able to track that with your patient um, and, and bring it into the discussion with the physician. If symptoms resolve, evolve, evolve, develop, these are usual flags for uh, a, diagnostic, a diagnosis that's correct or a diagnosis that is not correct. If um, things resolve, many times you're on the right track. If things don't resolve, sometimes it means that you're on the wrong track either with your treatment or with the original diagnosis. If new things, if new um, symptoms evolve or um, if your previous, uh, I'm sorry, if new symptoms develop or if your previous symptoms evolve, um, sometimes these are red flags that you are dealing with misdiagnosis. And the last thing to keep in mind and, 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 and really um, uh, bring into the forefront is that especially with complicated medical uh, cases where um, it's very hard to pinpoint what's going on, at some point it's important to bring in the question, what if symptoms are not usual? Um, in one third of all cases, research has shown that people show up with not the typical symptoms for the disease that they have. You know, it's not, you see one thing, but it's actually not what you would expect from the textbook case. So it's important to ask that information, uh, excuse me, to ask this question when uh, things are getting hard to figure it out. So with all of that information, I am going to finish today's webinar and I'm going to summarize uh, with five things to keep in mind. There are 12 million people that face a missed, delayed or wrong diagnosis every year in the US. Cognitive error and biases are a big source of misdiagnosis and there's something that we can all do to help physicians with that. Diagnostic error is more prevalent than other errors but causes more harm than other errors. And there are many opportunities to catch diagnostic mistakes. That's why it's important for all of us to play a role here. There's no one solution, but um, we're, we can all um, do something against this problem. Patient history, differential diagnosis, lab results, follow-ups, and care transitions are key elements of the diagnostic process where we, we can all be mindful of um, the things that we can do to avert uh, diagnostic error. And I would also like to remind you again, for those that are very interested in this field, that the Institute of Medicine report on diagnostic error, which is the first of its kind, will be hopefully coming out in the fall of 2015 um, and would uh, shed some light into what is known um, about misdiagnosis currently, what are the challenges in measuring uh, misdiagnosis and how we can move forward with uh, trying to fix it. And that concludes my talk and I will return this back to Ingrid to um, listen to your questions. I want to remind you again that you can write your questions in this little Q&A box um, and rest assured that even if we don't get to them today, we will be able to email you back um, uh, an answer to your question. Ingrid? Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Eo. That was a lot of uh, information and really updates us on uh, where we started and uh, the increasing attention to patient safety. Um, and at this point, we are open to questions. And uh, there is a slight delay in uh, typing your questions in. So go ahead and do that now. And uh, we'll, <clears throat> we'll be able to get uh, EO's responses. And I, I uh, noticed that uh, you mentioned there were some tools that you use from the Society of patient advocates that patients could go online and download and take with them to their physician offices and you indicated that you would um, email that to folks and we can do that 
as along with uh, questions and answers that come up, I'm still not seeing any uh, questions from attendees at this point. So I just wanted you to uh, comment a little bit on what tools are out there um, that individuals can use um, in addition to patient advocates. Sure. Um well, the society has um, this toolkit that, um, as I said, is, is a nice start. It's a comprehensive, um, a few pages long kind of, um, um, uh, not survey, but but the questionnaire that helps you put your story together and the symptoms and the medications and whether you have pain. Um, and it's a good start, I think, to. Um, it's a good place to start to to cr put together all that information. Um, there's a lot of research that is available uh, regarding what is going on, but I, I I would say it's not very patient friendly. I think the toolkit um, is probably the most patient friendly thing. Also, uh, Martina Aaron Clue, who is another um, patient advocate, very active in the field of misdiagnosis, uh, wrote a, an article I think a couple of years ago um, about misdiagnosis and how to avert it. And she has really nice um, uh, suggestions in that article about how to create your your history and what to include and what to do when you're at the physician's office. I would say that those are the two most actionable links that we can send to people to begin with and uh, uh, the the most notable research is in is available through links again of the Society to Improve uh, Error. Okay, well I I appreciate that, and thanks. I think that answers our first um, attendee's question, and so we will follow up and make sure that you get those resources. And I'm also seeing another question here. Um, the IOM study um, that's coming out in the fall, or the Institute of Medicine study, uh, will also have a video about patient and misdiagnosis. So we'll make sure that we have a link to that as well. And um, I'm not seeing any additional questions. Um, go ahead and type them in. And since we have a few minutes, I will see if um, uh, <clears throat> EO had any concluding comments. Otherwise, I will uh, continue with, uh, with some of the links that we have to get further information. So EO, did you have any final comments? Well, I would just like to say that uh, every patient, every encounter, every day is really an opportunity to avert harm. And um, in, in this lar large sea of healthcare issues to keep in mind, misdiagnosis is one more thing to uh, deal with for patient advocates, but it's very important. And the reason why it's so important is that it's the beginning of the journey. If you start on the wrong foot, you everything else after that is based on the wrong assumption. So it's very important to get diagnosis right and um, as I tried to explain in this webinar there are things that we can all do to um, to try to, to help physicians to make the right diagnosis. Um, Eo, we have uh, a final question that has just come in and <clears throat> It says, on the slide about the higher percentage of errors in hospitals, you pointed out um, that was surprising. Did you take into account that the symptoms treated in a hospital are generally more serious to begin with? So the risks of a more severe consequence of an error are naturally higher. Um, those, the data that I presented was data from that large uh, VA healthcare system. So I am sure that they took into this into account, but I, my understanding is that they just listed absolute numbers. So in essence, you know, they looked at how many people really um, were a victim of diagnostic error and uh, I think if I read this correctly, it was about a thousand um, people, 253. I don't know if we can return back to that. Can we do that? Uh, can um, I share my screen? I, I think that what we probably will do is just 
uh, write that out in your response to questions and answers. And while I make some, since we're almost out of time, since I make some uh, concluding comments, um, we will make sure that all attendees will have a copy of the webinar and uh, the slides that go with that and um, also any additional comments that you've made. And um, at this point, I don't see new questions. Uh, so I just want to thank everybody so much for uh, participating today. And I want to remind people that continuing education credits are available for both registered nurses and uh, masters in social work uh, who can benefit uh, for licensing requirements. And if you are interested in that, just go to washa.org, which you see on the slide. And also, since this is our second webinar, we are evolving and we really want to hear from you. We welcome your feedback. Um, right when we close this uh, webinar, you're going to get redirected to a brief survey, so your feedback is, is sincerely appreciated. And um, if you have to leave right away, we're going to email you the link. Uh, and if you have any just general uh, questions or comments or you have trouble connecting to anything like the CEU links, uh, just email us at info at washa.org. And we've also included our speakers' uh, contact information on the bottom of this slide, so iadolka at gmail.com, or on Twitter <clears throat> at iadolka. So uh, we really look forward to hearing from you, and um, we appreciate you spending time with us and uh, look forward to planning our next webinar, which will occur at the end of September. So look for that, and um, have a wonderful day. <laughs>